Welcome and thanks for joining us on NST Insight where we discuss the biggest current topics. I'm Sabrina Zainal, your host for this episode. Now, uh, today's topic is evolution of media and fake news. With the birth of the internet came the information technology boom, then the development of, and rise of social media, which launched a revolution uh, of media consumption. Now, internet access is cheaper, faster, more sophisticated and convenient causing a shift in the way information is consumed. Information is at our fingertips with smartphones being the choice of many. People no longer have to wait in front of the television and radio to hear the latest news. But with the information revolution comes great challenges. The new reality sees fake news spreading faster than before and has a readership that far exceeds the mainstream media. Within an hour, false information can spread across a radius of hundreds of kilometers, reaching hundreds of thousands of people. So to know more about the evolution of media and fake news, we have with us in the studio Glenn Van Zutphen. He is the founder of Van Media Group, a global media consultancy, and he has over 30 years of experience as an international journalist and communicator, and has held both frontline and media uh, and behind the scenes positions in print, radio, and television while li living and working in the US, Japan, Switzerland, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Welcome to NSD Insight. Sabrina, it is great to be with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Insight and Media Prima, and of course, all of our friends that are joining us on Facebook Live. And if you're celebrating it, happy Valentine's Day for those of you <laughs> who are uh, with us today. But it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so let's start off with this. Um, how do you feel about new ways to get the news? For example, TikTok videos and Instagram reels, these are not really conventional ways of you know, getting the, uh, the news. There's a lot of controversy around new forms of media, but there always has been. You know, there has been controversy from the earliest days of newspapers, yellow journalism when it first started, and the way that, uh, that young newspapers 120, 150 years ago handled the news as well. And then, of course, we had radio, and then TV, and, and, and internet, and new media, etc. cetera. So there, there's always been something that has disrupted media. And in the last five years or so, we have seen this more than ever. As we look around the world, uh, you know, different studies, different markets tell us that somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of people get their daily news content from a social media site. So this is something that is absolutely urgently important that we understand what's going on and, and how we face it in the future. Do you think then that um, social media could take over from traditional media? That's a huge question. and. Lots of people way smarter than I are looking at that and studying that, that very question. I don't think so. If traditional media can adapt to the changing world that we're living in. We've seen some motion toward that, some movement toward that. Uh, but there are other media organizations that still refuse to mm -hmm. accept the realities of where we're at today. I mean, the fact that you're doing this show on Facebook Live and many other organizations use social media, for example, TikTok. Uh, we've seen in the past uh, two years especially, many more mainstream news organizations using TikTok for breaking news and for other news stories. That would have been unthinkable even four years ago. So what's going to be next, right? Where are we going to go next with this amazing power of social media that we have? Now, of course, with the opportunity comes a lot of potential problems. Uh, that's for sure. Journalism will definitely face a few issues there. Uh, so does that mean we need to change um, mass media studies to adapt to this new reality? I think it's already changed, Sabrina, and fortunately it has. And students, for example, uh, this morning, uh, earlier today, we were talking at Sunway University right here in KL, and they were asking questions about TikTok and using alternative forms of media for uh, dissemination of news and information. It, it's already in the news curricula, and it has to be. And I would also say if, if someone is studying at an institution of higher learning and they aren't addressing it, they should probably check out of that place and go to another university or uh, institution uh, that is teaching it. Because it absolutely has to be part of, of it. But it has to also evolve as well. It can't just sit still and talk about Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. and TikTok. You know, what's next, right? What's next in Internet 3.0? What's next in the metaverse? What's happening with media and what is consumption of media and production of media going to look like? It's huge, huge questions. Um, and broadcasting as well, probably they would need to find out 
how to um, involve social media more probably in the future instead of having just news on the TV but have um, you know different platforms and how do they repackage that for um, you know the next generation I guess yeah we think about you know in the past 25 years let's say uh, in, in most of our lifetimes most of us who might be watching this today we've gone from a model where there was um, uh, and a morning newspaper maybe a morning TV news show and an evening newspaper or an evening TV show. Maybe headlines at lunch hour. Uh, and so you had deadlines at 11 p.m. the night before, and you had deadlines at maybe 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. You say that to somebody who's in Gen Z right now or coming up in Gen Alpha, mm -hmm. and they, they look at you and their eyes glaze over. They have no concept of why would you only have news on twice a day, you know, or two newspapers mm -hmm. a day. We expect the rolling deadline we expect stories to be refreshed every 30 minutes or every hour, or we go somewhere else to find what's happening with a news story. Now, it's, that's good news for news consumers, but it puts immense pressure on the journalists and the producers of news content to uh, freshen the story, to make it more interesting and more relevant, literally on an hourly basis. Um, right, so we have, um, we did interview a few members of the public on what they think um, about mass media studies, that, oh. whether they need to be changed or not. So let's have a look at what they thought. Right. I mean, those who are active in the social media, uh, I mean, particularly the teens, they don't differentiate which is the fake news and the real news. So I would say the teenagers nowadays. It is, it is, it is very, very, very unhealthy because uh, when you spread fake news, they ended up uh, getting a poor quality in the country and among the people. So it is very, very unhealthy. It's not good. The government, I mean, the authorities, they should come up with a very stringent uh, uh, gender. I mean, uh, for those who are spreading the fake news, you know, they have to come up with more and more solutions to this. Especially from WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp News and Telegram are actually Fake news normally comes from uh, individually or uh, personal blog and the uh, real news which comes from uh, Pernama and other related uh, official, uh, lah, official uh, website. website because of their personal content on their, on their personal blog any other um, what action should be taken against the people who spread fake news uh, the the uh, they can uh, pursue by the uh, reminder first mm -hmm. and then uh, up to the authority to uh, to take serious uh, action on them when I read about the fake news then I have to find other the things that relate to the fake news at the news whether is it fake or not mm -hmm. so i have to find other sources. ah yes other sources for me to see is it a real or a fake news maybe other than publicity or popular maybe it just one just to get the attention yes the attention and then just want to make it viral uh, just to tell the younger people or other people that fake news is huge problem for us because uh, fake news can be spread easily mm -hmm. and maybe it must uh, create an act maybe just go to prison Right, so we just heard members of the public give their opinion. Um, some of them mentioned that, um, you know, they do refer to other platforms because it, uh, they get m the l most updated news at a faster rate than the traditional conventional media. So is this something that we should celebrate? Um, because it's the spread of information without borders, yeah. but then you have, you know, on the other hand, you have how, how valid are these facts? Yeah. Because they're being... Um, to spread out there at such a faster rate. The, the old saying, the devil is in the details, right, really comes to mind here, Sabrina. And of course, I will 
always argue as a, as a news uh, professional for some 30 years that we should get as much news to people as fast as we can, as long as it's accurate mm. and as long as it gives context, right? Um, having said that, and this is not a new problem, the, the desire to rush to get news out first before somebody else does has been a problem that goes back many, many years, uh, actually many decades. So yes, it's good that we're getting these different sources of news out. The problem often comes down to verification. I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, making sure that the news is, is accurate, correct, in context, and, uh, and that is where I think the challenges lie. It's not just, anyone can get news out, but it's gotta be right, it's gotta be correct and accurate. And that's the challenge with social media where everybody's putting everything out and then, and then sharing it so quickly. Sharing first without even fact-checking, probably, in some cases, I think. We've seen that often, right? Mm -hmm. You know, every Definitely. day there's some kind of a case where somebody puts something out in the mm -hmm. media and, and didn't bother to check the facts, check that the video was mm -hmm. accurate or the photograph was accurate or whatever. So we, we have to be really, really mindful and really careful. But also news consumers have to take on a certain amount of responsibility themselves. You know, they have to appreciate, and any of you watching this today, you have to appreciate that what's out there and, and fed to you on your news feeds every day on whatever social site you're on might be true, hopefully it's true, but it might not be. And we, we need to take some ownership in figuring that out mm. as, as news consumers. I agree, but um, I guess as consumers, people are very attracted to viral news or news that has been kind of sensationalized just to get the eyeballs or the page views. So um, this will definitely affect kind of our society in some way. Do you think um, our well-being and harmony in this country will be affected by this sort of behavior or this sort of um, uh, kind of goal to, you know, update people as soon as possible, um, especially hot news? Yeah, sure. It can, it can impact everybody in Malaysia, in anywhere across Asia, in the Western world. Um, we have already seen some, some really devastating effects of bad news, wrong news. Uh, just look over the course of the pandemic. Just don't look at any other story. Look at the pandemic and you can see what the amount of damage that's been done by inaccurate news, by rumors, um, by conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. and, and much of this has been proven demonstratively false by any rational uh, metric. And yet, it still gets passed around and people believe it. And uh, you know, the more you tell a story, right, the more people will believe it, the more it's repeated, and the more, the more we watch our own echo chambers or access our own echo chambers mm -hmm. in social media, uh, thanks to the algorithms that force news on us certain ways, then we're gonna start believing that stuff, right? And it, it can be absolutely devastating to a lot of societies. Going back to what you said about um, the responsibility of netizens and you know, consumers, um, how do we tackle this? You know, people will be commenting on posts and news on, on, on social media, and sometimes that can kind of generate fake news or misinformation. So how do you tackle this situation? It, there's no way you can force it on people, that's for sure. But one of the awesome things about social media has been the democratization of information, right? And the internet especially, right? You can get information from wherever you want, whenever you want. And when I was growing up, you know, we felt very fortunate that my parents invested in not one set, but two sets of encyclopedias, mm -hmm. right? Um, two different, two different uh, companies that were mm -hmm. producing them. And back in those days, that could cost you seven, eight hundred, a thousand US dollars to buy a couple sets of encyclopedias. It was expensive. But as we know, encyclopedias grow old very quickly. Um, but we, we had the ability to search information. Of course, we could go to the public library or, or whatever before the internet. But now with the internet, we can find out literally anything within a few clicks on your phone, on your hand device, your mobile device. And so news consumers need to, need to use their brains wherever they are. And a lot of times we're not. And if, if you or, or me or one of our friends is hooked into a certain meme on their Facebook channel or their Insta channel or whatever, we need to actively, as, as thinking human beings, look for other sources of information 
uh, about that topic to see if there is another point of view. If you are conservative, look for something that's more centrist or left-leaning and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And people don't usually take the time to do that. I know, I know the real world that we're living in. We see something, we think we agree with it because it makes sense for our worldview, mm -hmm. and we pass it on. We, we share it with somebody else or we like it immediately. That's dangerous, in my opinion. Um, what can the government do to kind of educate and help or encourage people who are using social media to help them not do this sort of thing and be more responsible? I, I really don't know that it's, a, that it's a, something that the government should be responsible for, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think the government has many, many good uses and good uh, things that it can, can do to help people's lives. Um, when it, I think what this should go back to, kind of related to the government, is our education system. Now, if you consider that only the government, then okay, this is the government doing it, but you know, what, what has happened to the breakdown in our curriculum in schools? In, in Asia, in, in the Western world, you know, what has been taken out? Um, lessons in, in civics or in problem solving or in just multilateral and multidimensional thinking, for example. Many of these types of courses that used to be standard in many parts of the world have been deleted from curriculum, mostly in the name of saving money mm -hmm. in many places, especially in my home country in the U.S. Um, and so all of a sudden, for example, civics, teaching you about government and how government works. We see very clearly in the U.S. in the past, in recent years, that many people, even elected leaders, have no idea how the Constitution actually works and how government, our government was actually set up. And almost on a daily basis, somebody says something that is just so unbelievably ignorant about the U.S. system of governance, for example. And this is coming from politicians. We should know better. So this is a bigger breakdown than just government should be helping us do this, mm -hmm. this, and this. We need to look at educating people to think, educating people to value um, science, to value technology, and to value different points of view uh, other than their own so that they can get at some sort of a and I'll use it in air quotes, truth. Mm -hmm. I guess it goes really deep, doesn't it? I, it it's, it, I mean, it's a massive challenge, massive. And mm -hmm. lots of people have thought a lot about this. Um, there are no easy answers, and there's no short-term fix either. Um, right after this, we'll be touching on um, a campaign uh, in Malaysia called Freedom of Speech is Not Freedom to Lie. Mm -hmm. But um, right before that, we have uh, Secretary of the NSTP National Union of Journalists, De Atira Muhammad Yusuf, um, to give her opinion on um, what she thinks it means to be responsible media practitioners. Throughout the years, the media has gone through several changes. Uh, it used to be known as tra traditional media, uh, such as television, radio and newspapers, now we have new media with the presence of digital advancements and the internet. Um, you can uh, know, you can learn about new media uh, which you commonly or regularly use, uh, social media platforms, news websites and sometimes even messaging platforms such as WhatsApp or even Telegram. Basically based uh, on research by scholars, New media um, via online news provides an interesting two-way communication for a more comprehensive coverage, uh, typically for traditional and also online media. Um, people are more, much more engaged in new media because they are able to give feedback and also communicate with news outlets or even authority figures. In the last pandemic, according to the Communications and Multimedia Ministry, there has been uh, about 28 million uses of social media in Malaysia as of January last year. Um, it's shown that during the pandemic, Malaysians are more engaged uh, in using uh, social media platforms to gain access uh, to information about the coronavirus as well as um, the movement control order, which is, has affected uh, most of Malaysians and its residents here. In fact, last year, um, the number has increased by 2 million or 7% in just last year um, from 2020. 
um, because of the pandemic. So, uh, so the more people are uh, have more time because they are uh, forced to stay at home. So, hence they needed um, an outlet to not only follow updates but also be in uh, on top of news and updates from the government about the COVID-19. Maybe um, universities, um, schools can uh, start educating our uh, younger generation as well as their parents um, about the uh, damage of uh, creating of spreading false information because it could create panic and fear among the public which is actually um, damaging to the country's uh, peace. Being at home has caused people to monitor news um, through their social media platforms, um, searching for authority figures and uh, news agencies which are available. Uh, the best example for an authority figure is uh, Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah who has been constantly updating the public in regards to COVID-19 and other health matters um, in regards to Malaysia and also all over the world. So that was um, the Secretary of the NSCP National Union of Journalists, Theatira Muhammad Yusuf. Um, going back to uh, freedom of speech is not freedom to lie. So this is a campaign in Malaysia um, that happened during the COVID-19 or the when COVID-19 pandemic started, and it created a new trend where people began to turn to the mainstream media to get authentic news um, because they, were, they didn't want to be deceived by fake news online. So how do we convey to the society that not everything on alternative media is accurate, and how do we convince them to kind of go back to conventional or traditional media? Wow, how much time do you have? <laughs> well, <laughs> look, this is a challenge uh, across the world right now, mm -hmm. getting accurate information. Uh, in Singapore, we have the Protection Against Online Falsehoods, PAFMA law, that's been, uh, been around for uh, a bit over a year, year and a half or so, um, where the government is tracking online falsehoods and then going after people when they see uh, something that is, is not true. Um, I, I gen generally tend to take a more free market view on regulating speech uh, than, than perhaps many uh, countries do around the world. I feel like we in large measure need to rely on the crowd to self-regulate. And let me give you a good example. Recently with Spotify mm -hmm. and Joe Rogan, yeah. the podcaster, right? Mm -hmm. And those of your uh, viewers today on Facebook Live who aren't aware of it, hugely famous podcaster, paid hundreds of millions of dollars to be on the Spotify platform because he gets so many tens of millions of, of, listeners. of mm -hmm. listeners and downloads. But he has had many guests on his show that are outright lying about uh, COVID and, and other things, using derogatory speech, things like that. And so finally, two, uh, three major recording artists, uh, including Neil Young, said, uh, you know what, I'm done. I'm pulling all my music off Spotify, which is a huge thing. So here, and then all of a sudden what we saw was Spotify react immediately to uh, update its terms and, uh, of service mm -hmm. to make them more widely known. They took down a bunch of the offending content uh, from Joe Rogan's podcast. So all of a sudden there was a meaningful groundswell of people saying, wait a minute, this, this doesn't work for us and you as a social media network and a content provider need to do something about it. To me, I like that model because it is, it is organic, it comes from people that are you know, saying, mm -hmm. I'm not going to put up with bad content or content that's wrong. Now, social media is huge, right? There's a lot of platforms out there, so can that happen on every platform? Probably not. But where do we, where do we want government deciding who can say what? And where is that line between this, is a fact, this fact is correct and this mm -hmm. fact isn't correct? Because as we've seen with COVID, there is a lot of room for interpretation on, on certain aspects of our lives with COVID. Mm. And I won't even go into all of them now because we all know what they are, but everything from vaccines to masks, right? And, and social distancing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, so who is gonna be the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong? 
Is it one person sitting in a room somewhere in a government office? And I'm not just speaking about Malaysia, but anywhere. Or is it a group of people? What is their background? What are their biases or their concerns? So all of a sudden, some of that transparency that we would hope for in, a, in, in government control on speech is automatically not so clear. Now, in, in many places, there are already um, libel and slander laws on the book. So if you say something wrong, or if I, if I say something mm -hmm. to defame you or, or bring down your reputation, you can take me to court and sue me in many jurisdictions. A lot of people are arguing we need to just reinvigorate some of those laws and processes um, to combat fake news or online falsehoods. It's a very challenging topic. I, I agree mm -hmm. there's no perfect answer for it. And, and certainly at the speed at which news gets put online and passed around, perhaps some of those older methods of dealing with falsehoods are not as easy to use mm -hmm. anymore. There's definitely a fine line on um, when you have laws involved, like how do you determine, okay, what this person is saying is, okay, this is, they're acting out of freedom of speech or they're defaming someone. Like how, that's a very subjective, sometimes very subjective. Exactly, <laughs> it's always subjective, right? Yeah. It's always subjective, and you might, you know, you might actually like person X saying this, mm -hmm. and I might be sitting across from you saying, that's absolutely wrong. And, and who's, if it's not a scientific fact, if it's, an, uh, if it's a, uh, uh, some kind of just personal opinion, mm -hmm. Who decides? I mean, we all know whether the sun is up or the sun is down, whether it's day or night. Like that we can yeah. prove pretty easily. But those aren't the issues we're worried about proving. We're, we're worried about proving and talking about issues that are far more nuanced and complicated than that. And then you add in race and religion mm -hmm. and, and many of the things that many Asian countries really cherish and are very concerned about relations between religions and races and, and people of, of minorities and people of color and everything else. And then it gets even more complicated because even with, within some of those communities, the lines are not clear as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Exactly. So how, does it, how do governments ever really accurately, efficiently, and appropriately um, decide what's right and mm -hmm, what's wrong? wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's really tough. I like the idea that hopefully the crowd steps in and votes with their money, with their feet, with their uh, mm -hmm. online comments, things like that. Let's move on to um, licenses for private alternative media practitioners, like bloggers. Do you think, um, would you agree if Malaysia started giving out um, licenses for people like <laughs> bloggers? <laughs> um, yeah. what, what do you think? It's, I mean, it's a really loaded question. <laughs> um, I, I am not an expert on, on this particular uh, law that they're, that they're working on right now in relation to that. Um, if, if you think of yourself or if you think of your friends, perhaps, because you're in the media already, but if you think of your friends who are not in the media, um, who has a blog on cooking mm -hmm. or a blog on whatever, uh, you know, maybe they like to exercise or bicycle riding, should they be licensed? I don't know. I mean, I assume that they, the licensing regime is coming because they're worried about people that are going to say things that are hurtful to society in some way, right? Again, religion, race, government, whatever. And that, and that generally, when people want people to get registered, it's because they want to control some of those negative messages that might be perceived as being bad for society, mm -hmm. whatever that means. So. Okay, so then do you just limit it to certain bloggers or certain content bloggers? Or, you know, do the Kardashians now have to register uh, when they're blogging about fashion and blogging about new makeup? You know, where does it end? Where does it start? Where does it end? So I, I don't know enough about the law to mm -hmm. honestly speak uh, to this particular law, but I will just say, again, we, it's an area... First of all, you've got to decide what the rules, what the lanes are, what the out-of-bounds markers are. And then you're going to have to have a team of people, a big team of people, that are actually going to be watching every <laughs> blogger, every day, every post. Uh, maybe they're using AI, maybe they're using algorithms to figure out the words that come out of them or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but that's, you know, that's huge. Yeah, I and mean, how do we choose the, the, the team? How do we choose those people? <laughs> Again, it all comes down to, you know, many of these things 
maybe you can maybe you can have AI or an algorithm flag certain yeah. conversations, but at the end of the day, generally speaking, at this point in time, it comes down to a human making a decision that something is appropriate mm -hmm. or something is inappropriate. Who is that human, or who are those humans that are doing that? Exactly. What What are their preferences? What are their biases? What are they in favor of? What are they against? And and that's where it gets uh, tricky. Just a lot of questions surrounding that issue. I think. Um, I, I, believe me, I wish I had a simple <laughs> way, like yes, do it, or no, don't do it. I, I think it's far more complicated than that. We have a question from one of our Facebook viewers. All right. Um, He's saying it's interesting to see folks wanting the news first. So how do you balance getting the news out versus the best news? Uh, Neil Humphreys is a multi-award winning author of 25 books on Singapore. I know him well. He's my co-host on Money FM. Thank you, Neil, for the question, the shout out. Glad you're watching today from Singapore. Uh, uh, how do we get the news out? How do we get it out best? Again, I think it comes back to education. I think it comes back to having training for journalists from a, from a you know, university level, let's mm -hmm. say, where people are actually taught how to be journalists. Maybe it sounds a little bit old school, but you know, how do you source information? How do you go out and do proper interviews with not just one person, but with a variety of people to understand the nuance, the history, and the, uh, the circumstances surrounding the stories? And so I think, I think it's really important that we, we train every generation of, of not only journalists but content producers to, to look at the issues they're covering, again, whether it's news or whether it's sports or uh, you know, something fun or entertainment, mm -hmm. you know, cover it in a way that's meaningful, that makes sense. You know, don't take money to cover a story. Don't, uh, you know, don't take free stuff and not, div and not divulge that you've gotten free stuff to write a review on a new handbag or a new whatever. You know, you, as journalists, if people are going to rely on you to give information, they need to know what's going on behind the scenes and, and in putting that information out there. Mm -hmm. um, and there are still so many, so many um, blinders on a lot of people that they don't understand really what's happening behind the scene. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think transparency and training are the two best ways that we can get news out there. But, but I'm okay with news going out on social media networks. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely okay with that. I just think it has to go out in a way that's presented um, honestly, openly, transparently, and with good journalistic practice behind it. Um, so for fake news, um, if we don't control it now, what would be the impact on the society in the future? Yeah, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a huge debate on whether we should even call it fake news or mm -hmm. online falsehoods, right? I tend to lean more toward the online falsehood because the fake news is charged with a lot of emotion uh, in recent years. So how do we get it out there? How do we, how do we control it? And, uh, you know, media organizations like Media Prima and others work very hard every day with, with writers, reporters, editors, trying to put out the best product that they can put out that they believe is correct. Um, and, and that is always going to be where people go. I, I happen to think that, uh, and I am predicting that within the next couple of years, um, if not sooner than that, media consumers are going to start to gravitate back toward traditional media organizations that they perhaps trusted in the past, but maybe kind of got away from in recent years in favor of you know, news being passed around on Facebook mm -hmm. or on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, because it was just easier and more fun uh, and, and aligned with their, with their own uh, thought bubble. But I think people are tired of that. I think people want to get back to feeling like they can trust the news that they are being given. And that, I think, is the huge opportunity for traditional media outlets to come back into the game and say, look, We've always been here. We've always been trying to do the right thing and do it in a, in a really intelligent and trustworthy way. Come back to us. If you're wondering what's going on in Ukraine, come to us. If you're wondering what's going on in the elections in Malaysia and the latest government, whatever, come to us. If you're wondering what's happening in whatever, um, whatever realm, mm -hmm. don't just go to Facebook and pass on garbage that has been, you know, that you find on your feed. Actually seek out a uh, or an intelligent, thought, thought, you know, um, provoking, um, 
treatment of the media by the media, uh, a media story by the media. Mm -hmm. I think people are going to want to come back to that now. I think it's really important as well for them to come back. Um, it's just how do we, getting them to have that trust, I think, with conventional media. And for the younger generation as well, who are very hooked on things like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook to get their news, it's hard to get them to become the new audience for you know, traditional media. Well, this is where I think you know, there's, a, there's an interesting opportunity on TikTok right now. And we have seen, as I mentioned earlier, a, um, a, a, a real drive by many traditional news organizations that now have TikTok feeds. Mm -hmm. And they, they might be micro videos of, you know, of stories, could be breaking news or could be just stories of the day. But many traditional news organizations are now using TikTok in a really um, interesting and newsworthy day, uh, way every day. And this is one way that you're going to bring in uh, Gen Z or Gen Alpha um, news people, you know, news viewers, is on a platform like that. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe you do it on Twitch, or maybe you do it mm -hmm. on wherever, Discourse, or, you know, whatever you're going to do, Discord. Um, this is a way that, that you can bring in the next generation of news consumers by giving it to them on a platform and in a way that makes sense to their viewing habits. Um, we also have another question sure. um, from our Facebook live viewers. This is from Fazrik Kamarudin. He's saying, hi, Mr. Glenn, what is your best moment as a journalist and <laughs> what excites you uh, the most for the future of media? Mm. I'll, I'll take the second question first. Technology is what excites me the most because it is never ending, it never stopping. Mm -hmm. Again, if you even went back three years ago or four years ago you and, and started your history of news there, where we are today is just unbelievably different. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we were, or 15 years ago, we were talking about citizen journalists, right? Everybody with a phone could be a mm -hmm. reporter. Well, we figured out that that's actually not true. We figured out that journalists and reporters actually have skills that everybody else who just has a phone doesn't have. And at the same time, too, we want to understand, you know, what's, it's, it's not enough to just show us a car accident at, after the accident, mm -hmm. right? And assume that one party was at fault or another. We see this all the time. There's a, there's a platform called Stomp in, in uh, Singapore, uh, Singapore Press Holdings. And, and people always post these videos on Stomp of, of, of an event, mm -hmm. right? Something happened. But there's never any context around it. Like what happened just before? What happened just after? Who was it you know, involved? What, what were the circumstances? Mm -hmm. And so you know, citizen journalists, I think, have some role to play. But we've all realized that, that they aren't the ones where you're going to get a solid news story with understanding about what that story is. Mm -hmm. you'll, get a, you'll get a convenient video clip or a picture, but that's all you're going to get. So I'm excited about how technology can move forward, um, can advance in a way that will let us see more stories from more places in the world, uh, you know, places where there aren't news bureaus for the major orga news organizations, but where we can rely on getting good information. Um, there's, a, there's a great uh, organization called Storyful uh, that uh, you may have heard of, yes, right? Yeah. It was started by some uh, friends of mine, some former colleagues uh, from CNN when I was at CNN. And they give the raw feed, they don't give a lot, they give some context and some explanation about what's going on in the scene. But they basically just run the video, and, and you decide what's going on, you decide what's important about that without a lot of editorializing around it. And they feed to news organizations and things as well. It's, a, it's an excellent model and a very interesting one uh, as well. Um, for me personally, exciting thing, I think the, one of the more exciting events that I covered was um, the handover of, uh, of Hong Kong back to China in 1997. Um, that was just, I was in Hong Kong at the time, and that was just an amazing time. The lead up to it, and then actually the, um, the actual day it happened, and then the days after, and the months after it happened, um, what was going on in Hong Kong at that time. And I'll tell you one more, just since we've, we've um, come through uh, the U.S. leaving Afghanistan. Um, so when I was working at CNN International um, in Atlanta, I was anchoring world news shows, and I was able to do the first international interview, the first international TV interview with Hamid Karzai when he entered, uh, when he entered Kabul after the, um, the coalition forces had put down the Taliban. And that was a really, really interesting moment. 
and I, I did a phone interview with him uh, live on CNN International. And the hope uh, that he was expressing for that country 20 years ago uh, and, and how they were going to reshape the society and make it more equitable for everybody and all of that. Um, and those, those words and that interview just echoes in my mind. Um, and we look at where that country is today and it is a far cry from where he was hoping and predicting mm -hmm. it would be uh, back in those early days. So it's been fun to kind of watch the arc of news history on some of these stories um, over, the, over the course of the years that I've been working. Great, thank you for sharing that. Uh, mm. <laughs> um, I have just one more question. Sure. Um, how do you do? You have any tips for identifying what is what should be considered a piece of um, fake news, or how you uh, define yeah. it as um, online falsehood? Um, and how can you ex uh, and can you explain how fact checking and news analysis are done? Hmm. Uh, again, another big topic that we yeah. could spend a long time talking about. Uh, I have, over the recent years, um, been affiliated with the Google News Initiative as a Google News Tools Trainer. And GNI, as it's called, Google News Initiative, uh, has a whole suite of free tools that journalists and, frankly, anybody can access to verify information, mm -hmm. to, um, to do proper searches on information that comes your way to do reverse photo searches and reverse video searches and things like that to make sure that the images that you are seeing are, are what they say they are. And, and a whole other suite of, of data visualization and things like that. And if you, if you, Google, if you Google Google News Initiative, uh, GNI, um, you can go to their, to their web page and you can see all these things and, and use many of them yourself. So, I'm a firm believer in using the tools that we have, and, and there are many non-Google tools as well that people use in, in news verification. Um, and of course, Snopes.com and, and other um, uh, verification sites are out there. You can go to those sites and, and put in a topic and, or the latest news story, and it will give you a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down and, and verify it because they've already done the work for you. So there, there's a lot of ways that we can figure out whether something is real or whether something is mm -hmm. false. Uh, most of us don't want to take the time to do it. We just see it come through on our feed and we, you know, we kind of believe it or we don't believe it and we respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the kind of danger is these days, I think, in the way that news is presented online. Definitely something that um, people should really start practicing and um, just ev the everyday person should start practicing. <laughs> People just, you know, journalists are notoriously curious, right? Mm -hmm. Curious about the world around them. That's, that's why we love to do the job we do. You know, you love to do interviews, you love mm -hmm. to present the news, um, you love to do all these things, as do all of us who are journalists. We need some of that curiosity to filter down to news regular news consumers who are not journalists. Mm -hmm. We have to have people get curious about what they're reading, what they're looking at, what they're watching, because it matters. Mm -hmm. It matters if stuff is wrong. It matters if we are passing on stuff mm -hmm. that is wrong. And if a friend or somebody on your news feed or, or your social channel says, hey, I've just found out that what you just posted isn't really mm -hmm. that picture of that thing you said it was, take it down, delete the post, get rid of it. And, and do your part, whatever mm -hmm. small part that is, to claw back some, some honesty and some reality in, in the information sphere in which we live. Well, it's been such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all your insights and your tips. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this episode of uh, NST Insight. Um, so a uh, big thank you, Glenn mm -hmm. Van Zutphen, for spending your time with us and for Sabrina, thanks to you. Yes. Thanks to Insight, all the Facebook Live folks. It's really been fun to chat with you all, and I wish you all good news reading and good news watching. Now, do tune in again next time. Until then, please do stay safe and take care. <laughs>